Good afternoon and welcome to this special edition of Somerville Media Center Live with the state delegation. I'm Joe Lynch. Today is Thursday, April 23rd, 2020. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the show State Representative Christine Barber from the 34th Middlesex District and State Representative Denise Provo from the 27th Middlesex District. Welcome to the show. How's everyone doing? Christine, how you doing? How you feeling? Um, doing okay. Thank you so much for having us. Um, it's important to keep getting information out and trying to connect with each other. Um, and I know we're all, we're all weary and um, there's a lot still going on. So thanks to everyone for tuning in. Our pleasure. State Representative Denise Provo making your second appearance on Somerville Media Center Live using virtual reality. Uh, well, it's these days, um, we'll, we'll take what reality we can get, I suppose. Uh, I agree. Um, so, yes, thank you. Thank you for having us. There's, um, there's plenty that's happened since the last time we spoke, and we're eager to tell people in Somerville what they want to know. So, Denise, while we have you on there, um, one of the major, major announcements that Governor Baker made is... Um, the end of the school year for this year. The kids will not be returning to school this year. Right, right. Originally, schools were scheduled to reopen on May 4th, um, and it's now official that school will not resume um, this, this spring. Uh, daycare centers, however, are scheduled currently to reopen on Monday, June 29th. Let's stay with education for a little bit and look at some of the ramifications of that and some of the things that you know that may be taking place on Beacon Hill. Um, Representative Provo, you, your district it comprises a vast majority of Somerville yes. and you share some of that with Representative Barber, other parts of it with Representative Conley. And from the Somerville perspective, the seniors appear to be the ones that from an emotional standpoint, let me just put it that way, they're gonna miss out on prom, they're gonna miss out on end of year graduation, mm -hmm. they're gonna miss out on actually physically being able to say goodbye to their friends and wish everybody well. And I'm also sure, knowing from my own family, that there are seniors who are scheduled to graduate this year who are heading off to college mm -hmm. next year. Can you kind of lay out for us what what Beacon Hill is thinking about in terms of continuing an educational system through the summer, if they're thinking about that at all? To my knowledge, that has not been part of the discussion. Um, I'm on the Higher Education Committee, which is, you know, after high school. Uh, I'm not on the Education Committee, which covers K through 12. Um, so, from what I've been able to gather, maybe Rep. Barber knows more, there's no discussion of summer programming. And part of the problem, I think, is that we don't yet have a budget for the fiscal year that's going to start on July 1st, um, nor do we have a schedule for adopting a budget, and revenue has fallen off the cliff, obviously. Rep. Barber, do you want to well, maybe I should turn it over to Joe. He's in charge here. No, this is your show. You, you guys discuss it the way you need to get the information out. I think uh, I agree with, with, um, with Denise's um, uh, assessment. And it's true that we don't have, we're still just getting a sense of the budget right now. And I think for the most part, um, the education has been left up to the to the districts to figure out and and both Somerville and Medford um, have been doing a good job at, at that on the local level but um, I agree we haven't heard about summer programs at this point. Let me, let me bring it back to uh, Denise Provo for a minute. The state-run uh, colleges and, and universities, mm -hmm. do we have a sense if they are going to open on time in August, September? It looks unlikely. Um, at least for the, the state universities, that there will be a physical opening in September. Um, both 
state and private institutions who are starting to talk about the fall are doing so in terms of online classes. And I think a lot of that may have to do with the actual, the dormitory style living, as well as the physical proximity within the classrooms. Right, the classrooms might be manageable, but campus life is much less so. Um, the dorms, um, the parties, the sports, the proximity in gyms and dining halls, doesn't matter how far you space people apart in lecture halls. If they're going to be mingling elsewhere, then you have the potential for um, contagious disease to pass. Good point. Rep. Barbara, from, from the standpoint of, you, you cover part of the Medford, um, Medford constituency as well. Is there any talk in Medford about how they're gonna proceed um, for next year with K through 12? Or have you heard anything about Tufts University? Um, so I have not. Um, I mean, at Medford, the local district is doing, as I said, great at you know <clears throat> seeing the rest of this year through and figuring out how to do that virtually. Um, for Tufts, I have not yet heard. I could have. I could have missed something. Um, but the last I heard, um, you know, they're obviously trying to finish their year remotely, um, and and. Um, and I don't know what their plans are for the fall, but I assume it's, it's similar to what was said about the state universities. It's really hard to envision that right now. Got it, got it. I'm gonna stay with, um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna stay with Representative Provost just for a minute. Representative Provost, there, there is something that's come up, um, and I don't know how long the State House has been working on it, but it has to do with electronic notarization. Can you, can you kind of walk us through that a little bit and what it means for businesses and individuals? Yes, um, because of the closure of non-essential businesses and the impossibility of people getting together in rooms, it had, it's been uh, difficult to impossible for people to say, close on real estate that they're hoping to purchase. A lot of um, healthcare practitioners especially want to make wills and other kinds of documents to, to get their affairs in order. Uh, in many cases, their signatures need to be witnessed by a notary public. And there is a bill which I've been working on for weeks um, which passed the House earlier this week and maybe, uh, sorry, passed the Senate and may be acted on by the House today, which is going to allow for notarization by video conference um, with a lot of safeguards built in for uh, identification and record keeping. And many people have been waiting eagerly for that to happen on Beacon Hill. So I'm very grateful. So uh, we had briefly discussed it. Can you walk us through who would be most affected by that? Is it actual attorneys and no, all notary publics or is it limited to those with legal degrees? Well, it's this kind of notarization will probably for the most part take place in law firms or uh, potentially businesses that employ attorneys because the, the way the bill is written, it applies to attorneys and, and their paralegals who, who are notaries. Um, there was an effort by Chambers of Commerce <coughs> and others to, to allow all notaries to take advantage of video conferencing, but there was a concern that the safeguards were not in place to allow this to be done without too much danger of fraud. Um, so it's limited. It's also limited for the duration of the COVID emergency. So, so you know, from my own personal experience, I've had to, um, I've had to engage with a notary 
in my banking practices. Mm -hmm. So this bill does not include that unless that banker happens to be an attorney. Uh, or a paralegal working for an attorney. I assume banks have law departments where these kinds of legal documents could be witnessed and processed. And certainly, certainly the mortgage department of banks, um, I think will will be will have to be involved in order to produce closing documents for real estate transactions. So I imagine they they could use this the same uh, video conferencing setup to to notarize signatures on other kinds of contracts or documents that need them. And I assume it would ha also have to do with privacy concerns. So for instance, when you walk into a customer service area in a bank lobby, you couldn't very well do teleconferencing or video conferencing at that customer service desk because of the sensitive nature of what you're doing. Right. And they, you know, the, um, one of the changes that was made relatively recently to the bill is a requirement that these video conference notarizations be recorded and the recording kept for 10 years. So there's a certain amount of technology that has to be in place even to comply with the requirements of the bill. Great. Well, it's just another way of we're going to have to adapt to uh, a, an uncertain future when it comes to conducting business. Yeah. I mean, look at us conducting business over Zoom. But you're, you're both all pros with dealing with me as a, as a kind of an interviewer. So it's a little bit easier. Let me give myself a big pat on the back on that one. Interviewer uh, par excellence. Oh, please. Um, so we've covered those two. Um, I know, Christine, you wanted to talk a little bit more about um, some of the issues surrounding immigrants, uh, immigrants' rights and immigrants um, in general and the new housing law. Do you want to take it away? Sure, uh, thanks. And I think, you know, something that um, has become very clear over the last few weeks is that while um, this virus is, is hitting all of us, it is not hitting all of us equally. And um, there are certain, uh, certain groups who are really being um, much more hard hit communities of color, immigrants being um, central among among those. So um, one of the things I've been focusing on is is looking at how immigrants in our communities are being um, are being uh, affected. And so two things that I wanted to mention. One is. Um, Applying for unemployment is really you know, technical. You have to provide a lot of information. So there wasn't, there was an, only an English application um, when we started this pan pandemic, um, which was really um, troublesome for people who spoke languages other than English, especially because community groups are, are closed. It's really hard to get someone to help you right now. Um, so um, I led an effort, which is a sign-on letter to the governor, um, who then responded fairly quickly, honestly, and, and now there is uh, application in Spanish, Portuguese, um, and I believe there's seven languages, so seven of the top languages in Massachusetts um, that's recently come out. Um, and, and another area for immigrants is people who have been paying taxes but have paid through what are ITIN numbers. Um, and it's a way of, of paying taxes. Um, if you don't have a social security number, you pay with an ITIN. So these are people in our community who are working, who are paying taxes, and they were not eligible for the federal stimulus payment that a lot of us um, just got or are getting, um, the, you know, 12, up to $1,200 plus more money um, per dependent. So these were, you know, these are taxpayers who were left out of that federal program. So I just filed a bill um, called the Immigrant Taxpayer Protection Act, and that would provide a stimulus payment for um, the I-10 filers for that group of, of immigrants um, who, you know, have been or have been working, have paid into the system, but haven't been able to get the assistance that they they really need as well. Um, Christine, I just Christine, I'm, so, 
I'm sorry for one second. This is a state program. This is yeah, not so because federal. the federal government, you know, uh, that group was left out of the federal program. This is something I filed at the state level. So the state would fund this program for that group of people. Um, and it would be equal really to the stimulus that the rest of us got. So depending on the size of your family, you would get a certain amount of, of stimulus. But this would only be applicable to those with non-citizenship status who have paid into the system. Is that correct? Yeah, so people who have, I mean, the way we can find them and, and connect with them, similar to the stimulus payment, is through their ITIN number because they have paid taxes. So right. we have record of them through the tax system. Um, so it would be just on a subset of immigrants, um, uh, but it is people, right, who are paying taxes and who are in our communities. Okay. So we have, um, we have some safety net issues when it comes to um, how we're trying to support people during a pandemic. I mean, there's always gonna be people who are falling through that safety net. So that's one way that you and the legislators on Beacon Hill are trying to uh, assist people. I mean, if you paid into the system, um, rather than wait until you get citizenship or wait until your money is due to come back to you, give it to them now, help them subsist now. Yeah, and there's really no way for those folks to get assistance right now um, because of the, the gaps in the federal program, um, which are not likely to, to change. Um, so that it's you know, something that we're looking at at the state level um, and something that California did something similar a week or so ago. And, they passed. and do you wanna stay with the uh, new unemployment update? the new unemployment update. Yeah, there's a new update. I wanted to make sure people know. Um, so there's a new program called a PUA, it's the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. Um, and this is for people um, who are self-employed or you know, freelancers or in the gig economy. And it's for people who are working part-time, so they might not otherwise qualify for unemployment. Um, it's a totally separate system portal. So you go through, you go to the unemployment um, website, but it's a different system. So if you uh, applied for unemployment, you know, a couple weeks ago and you were denied, you actually have to go and, and reapply because it's separate. Um, but I've actually heard pretty good things about this system that it's, it's a little easier than the um, traditional unemployment system. So wanted to make sure that, you know, freelancers and others know about that. You can go online, um, you know, my, Web page and there's there's lots of places to, to find that address but um, it's the PUA program. Anecdotally uh, let me just ask both of you a question about um, your Christine I know you live in Somerville but you do represent a good part of Medford so what's happening in Medford in terms of these gig gig economy workers have you heard anything in terms of how bad it really is? Well I've definitely heard from people who um, were frustrated that they couldn't get unemployment and were frustrated that the unemployment system doesn't, you know, yet recognize that type of work and, you know, certain companies, um, you know, formulated their way of doing business, you know, without providing these protections for workers. Um, so in the last week, I mean, it's this, pro this, um, the PUA actually rolled out a little sooner than we expected it to. So it was nice to get to, to tell people who have been frustrated, okay, there is help now, you can apply today. Um, so we wanna make sure people know about that. Um, Cause it, definitely in Medford and in Somerville, we've heard from a lot of people who have, um, who have been really hurting. I mean, it's been, it's, you know, five weeks into this crisis and, right. and we're just right. rolling that out. Rep Provo, how about you on the Somerville side? Well, there are many people um, who've encountered difficulties applying for traditional unemployment, um, which goes back to when, when our, uh, our Commonwealth had new unemployment insurance software custom written. It's still not entirely debugged. Um, but as we've been helping people with the new PUA system, they have discovered um, for themselves that for people who have both conventional jobs and uh, self-employment income, you can't apply for both. 
and it, it may not be a gap in the system, but it's certainly hurting certain people who might work at a conventional job, you know, to get health insurance coverage or to supplement their, their freelance or their self-employed income. Uh, and they are, they're, they're very frustrated to discover that if they've already qualified for regular unemployment, even though it may only cover half or less of their income, they're not also eligible for PUA. So I just want to put it out there. Seems, Some, pat seems patently unfair. The well, it's, it's certainly a great hardship for people who are working multiple jobs to pay their rent. Um, and some people have, have written to the state reps thinking we can change that. But PUA is a federal program and they really need to talk to our representatives in Congress and in the U.S. Senate to potentially make any changes there. Congress sure. does a fifth uh, economic stimulus bill. Sure, sure. Um, we're going to try to get um, for next week's, uh, next week's show, uh, Senator Jalen, with apologies, Senator Jalen was going to try to join us this afternoon. She got called away at the last minute. Um, and we were going to talk, be talking about some more in-depth issues with health care. And I think that may be a topic for next week. All of the state delegation is invited back to chit chat about that. But I wanted to move into one other, one other area, and that is on the housing law that both of you have been working on. Either one, take it away. Defer to Rep. Harper. She let Thanks. her take a turn. Okay. Thanks, Rep. Provo. Um, so I think as we've talked about and, and um, others have talked about on the show previously, um, the whole delegation has been working on a bill to put a moratorium on ev evictions and foreclosures and keep people housed during this crisis. Um, this was a bill filed by Mike Connolly and Kevin Honan, who's the chair of the housing committee. Um, so that bill passed and it's now law. Um, it passed the House and Senate on Friday, I believe, and the governor signed it, I believe it was Monday, Monday although all, all days seem the same now, but yeah. Monday. Um, Is there a retroactive date to that? Um, that is a good question. The bill stops the eviction process, so it actually stops landlords from even serving eviction notices. Um, and I know it goes, so it goes through the emergency, obviously, and then 120 days past the end of the emergency. And I'm actually not sure about retroactivity. Rep. Provo, do you know that answer? I. I think it would freeze. I don't know that it can um, unfile a, no, um, a notice to quit or um, a summary process action that's been filed in a court, but obviously the, the clock would stop on anything that has been filed. And it's worth pointing out that this um, anti-eviction uh, protection extends to small businesses as well as to um, to renters to of residential property. Well, I, I need to ask one other question that it's an anecdotal thing. I don't have factual information on it, but it's something that came to me is that um, in our efforts, our collective efforts to protect folks, through no fault of their own, they're being affected by a, world, a global pandemic. We are protecting people's paychecks, we're protecting their housing, we're protecting their uh, insurance, health insurance. One thing that came to mind is that a very unscrupulous automobile repossessor, mm. his business has increased markedly. And this is local, but it's not something I got off the, the internet is that where you have a used car dealer who is in the business of financing those automobiles, there has been two instances where the cars have been repossessed, which only adds misery to agony for a lot of these people. Do we have any kind of protection when it comes to personal loans or auto loans or anything like that? There, there has been legislation filed um, relative to debt collection 
but it hasn't reached the level of priority of stopping evictions or, or some of the broader stroke bills that that affect the, the most people in in the most um, severe way. And you know, as the emergency drags on, I'm sure we will be getting down to to other abuses. Um, price gouging is one that I've heard about. Uh, fraud and um, these these kinds of predatory practices by debtors or another. And one yeah, of, sorry, one Christine. Of the, one of the challenges um, as we looked at this um, right in the early days of the pandemic, um, and there are bills out there. Um, the Division of Banks in Massachusetts did put out a a notice, although it is encouraging lenders to work with um, debtors, debtors is not a requirement, but there's a question if the lender is licensed here in Massachusetts or if they're licensed at the federal level, um, there may be different rules that they follow and different things we can do at the state level. Um, so it's a it's a definitely a challenge and something that people are, are still facing. Um, we're facing that with student loans. Um, most student lenders are at the federal level. So that's something that we've been working on supporting um, students with student debt at the state level, but a lot of the change will have to come from, and the forgiveness would have to come from the federal level. No, I think, I, I think there are, you know, many more aspects of life where people uh, need protection the further we go into this. And, and one of the things that came to light last week was a lot of restaurateurs and the small businesses that are now crushed underneath this have taken personal loans from banks or finance companies and some of the more unscrupulous finance companies are coming after them for those personal loans because they don't fall into the category of a construction loan or a so for instance they may have gone to a bank to buy the newest 12 burner gas grill for their restaurant you know and those things aren't cheap they got a personal loan for $50,000 for that, and now they can't pay it. So more to come on that. We, don't, we have a, 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 about a minute and a half left, and I want to just break it wide open between the two of you. Anything else you want to chit-chat about, um, feel free. Well, I would encourage anyone who's being subjected to what they think are unfair or predatory um, practices, extortionate practices by people, institutions to whom they owe money, uh, contact their state legislator, um, and we would refer them probably to the Attorney General's office. So they Good could point. also go directly to our Attorney General, Maura Healy. Good point, very good point. I, well, uh, I would add, just keep social distancing, wear a mask, we all are in this together and we need to keep at it, um, even though it's hard. You got it. I want to thank my guest today, State Representative Denise Provo, State Representative Christine Barber. Hope to see you more. Um, but for now, this is the way we're going to do it. Thank you again. Thank you. For the Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.